and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and top selling games from July 1988. I check out the Interface 1 Biz. I play some games, chat to Jeff, and type in a game. But first, it's the news. CRL are in big trouble. After an argument with its distributor Electronic Arts earlier in the year, things have not gone well, and they have now laid off all of their programmers. CRL claim that a failed partnership with Electronic Arts saw them pull out of a major distribution deal, leaving CRL with a massive debt of £204,000. Electronic Arts have said they pulled out because the games CRL were looking to publish at full price were, to quote, little better than budget games. In an attempt to save CRL, they have applied for an administrative order which would hold any creditors for three months. But now they're in a legal battle with Electronic Arts over the whole fiasco. It seems Elite are in a spot of trouble with its new game Overlander. US Gold have made threats because they believe it's a blatant plagiarism of the arcade game Road Blasters, to which they have the rights. They have further said that major distribution companies, Microdealer, LeisureSoft and Centersoft, that form part of the US Gold company, would not distribute it. Steve Wilcox of Elite is denying any wrongdoing, claiming it's an original game. US Gold are also threatening Titus for its game Fire and Forget, claiming similar resemblances. Sales of Spectrum games are in decline, at least according to Gallup. They say that they are down to their lowest since December 1987, with just 41% of the market. The Commodore 64 shows slight improvement though, up to 23%, with the Amiga and Atari jointly accounting for 22%. As the new 16-bit machines become more popular, Spectrum game sales would obviously slow down, both in development and in sales. As the saying goes, the writing is on the wall. Elite have won the right to produce computer games based on two well-known cartoons, Top Cat and Wacky Racers. That is, of course, if Elite don't get pounded into the ground in their current legal battle with Electronic Arts. And now onto the top five games. At number 5 is Elite from Firebird. At number 4 is Outrun from US Gold. At number 3 is Cybernoid from Houston Consultants. At number 2 is Match Day 2 from Ocean. And at number 1 is Renegade from Imagine Software. was the news and top selling games from July 1988. There are many interfaces for the Spectrum that allow you to use modern, fast storage like SD cards or compact flash cards. However, for the vast majority of those cards, that is their single function. Many have their own operating systems for access, which uses FAT32 formatting. A good point there, but it also means there are limitations and new commands to learn. Alternatively, the Interface 1 Biz, however, is a great all-rounder and has many plus points. Firstly, it is fully microdrive compatible. It uses the standard Sinclair ROM routines to read and write data to the SD card. This obviously means any software written to use microdrives will work without any messing about. Secondly, it has a USB port. You can connect it to your computer and not only use it as a file server to load games, but also access the internet. Thirdly, it has a PS2 port, so you can plug in a keyboard or mouse. The mouse will be treated as a Kempston mouse too, so again, fully compatible. Fourthly, it has a joystick port that emulates a Kempston joystick. And lastly, it has a file browser for fast loading of games. Let's take a look at all of these in order. Because the interface has full compatibility with micro drives, the SD card cannot be FAT32, so this is bad news if you want to drag and drop files onto it like other cards. A new SD card will need setting up first, and to do this you need some software on your PC. You insert the card, and set it to be drive S. You install the prep and copy software by running the setup file. You install the server app, again by running the setup file. And at this point, once everything's installed, you can actually copy folders and games to your card. To do this, you locate a folder with some games in it, right-click and select Send To, and select Logical Disk Copier. 
This will ask you for a drive number, and these drive numbers represent the microdrive numbers. I would recommend downloading the game files from the Interface One Biz website, as they are already preset with loading screens and poke files. The structure of the data means you can simply select drive zero during the install, and a ton of games will be written to your card, ready for use. The process takes about three minutes per drive, but it's worth it in the long run. Each microdrive is limited to 32 meg in size, but then again that's going to hold a lot of games. Once you've done that you put the card back into the interface, plug it all in and power on. To enable the interface you have to hold down the NMI button for about two and a half seconds, at which point the right hand LED comes on. A quick press of the NMI button again and the second LED comes on and you're ready to go. You can now use the interface as though it were multiple microdrives. To select which drive you want to use, you use the cat command. Doing a cat on drive 2, which was the number I copied the files to, shows a list of files. You can now load them, first setting the file that you want to load, and then using the normal load command. This worked fine for tap files, but I did discover some TZX files had a problem. You can also use SNA files if you like. The loading is fast, but for faster selection you can use the file browser. Again, once the LEDs are all on, you reset the spectrum and enter run. This will load up the file browser. Here you can see a list of files. You can move up and down a file at a time. You can move up and down a page at a time. Or you can move up and down between drive numbers. You have options to select information about the game, if it's available or to view the loading screen. Once you locate a game, you press enter and it will load automatically. Now on to saving. Again, using the normal microdrive commands, you can save code, screens or anything you like to any microdrive if they're set up. To set them up, you just use the cat command. Saving is fast, and as I mentioned before, any program that is microdrive compatible will work. With both saving and loading, you can create and use subfolders too. To create a subfolder, you add a slash to the save command, and this will create an empty subfolder of that name. You can also switch to that directory by loading it, again remembering to add a slash at the end. You can also open tap files for output, meaning you can write to the normal emulator file format with a limit of 16 megabyte per file size, and that's quite useful. You first do a save using the .t extender, which will create an empty tap file. You can then use the normal save file name convention as you would a tape, and this gets saved to the tap file. Other useful features include an option to specify a snap file that once created will save a snapshot of the game you are currently playing when you press the NMI button. You can also add pokes to games via the file browser, another useful tool. Now onto the client server things. To use your computer as a server for the interface, you load the server applet. Connect a USB lead, power on, and hopefully, if all is well, the left hand LED will illuminate, meaning you have a connection. You then enable the interface as normal by holding down the NMI button for two and a half seconds, followed by a quick press. You should now have four LEDs lit, and you're ready to go. To connect, you open a channel, then you can do a cat to see the contents. My C drive was used, and you can see the files on my PC, and also on the Spectrum. You can move into folders as described before, do a cat and see the files, and you can now load them as normal. And there it is, a game loaded from my PC, Fire a USB lead onto my Spectrum. Brilliant. 
Not only that, but you can create new folders using the save command and then save code to that folder on your PC. That's remarkable. You can also get the game browser to browse your PC files if you want to make things even faster. This interface gives a lot of different functions for a very reasonable price. It also has additional boards you can plug in to give you Ethernet connectivity. I haven't covered the mouse connector or joystick port in this review because, well, there's not a lot of point to it. They both work as you'd expect. So, a great all-rounder then, and something worth considering if you need flexibility, because this card certainly delivers that. The one type of game I never play are flight sims. I hate them, all those controls to think about, and the end result is that you land a plane somewhere, hopefully on the runway. Not very exciting in my eyes. But in a recent box of games I got, there was F-16 Combat Pilot by Digital Integration, who also gave us other sims like Fighter Pilot, Tomahawk, Night Gunner, and others. F-16 looks very impressive in its large box, with screenshots on the back that are obviously not from the specy. Inside though, and the list of commands reminds me why I dislike this style of game. And the huge manual. Pages and pages of it. I mean, who wants to read all of that? Loading the game, and there's a nice mission select screen, but deep down I get the feeling that this is going to be the best part about the game. Let's dive in at the deep end then, and head for Deep Strike. Ooh, I think I've broken it. Is that supposed to look like that? A quick check in the manual, and yes, yes, it's supposed to look like that. But it does look different in the manual. So now we have to arm our plane. I'm not going to bother reading stuff, I'll just throw on some sidewinders and maybe some mavericks. That done, and I'm ready to go. Control list, yeah, power, mm -hmm. okay, let's go. At least I can get this thing off the ground and flying about, even though I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. It isn't long before I get a target, then skipping through the weapons available, one of them locks on, and I can fire. One target down, and there's another. It seems they all want a missile up. Once they have been dealt with, and it's off for something else. The graphics are quite good for a flight sim on the specy, and everything moves smoothly enough. The sound is okay, but I'm not sure I could put up with that constant hissing sound. Eventually I get another target, and take them down quickly. I suspect at some point I may run out of weapons though. After some time I locate a large target on the radar, and nothing seems to lock on. Maybe I set up the wrong weapons. The machine gun is useless, so I change course and set off for something else. Just as the game is growing on me, some kind of warning sound is triggered. I've got absolutely no idea what it is, so I fly about in a vain attempt to make it stop. Eventually, it does. But not for long. The red screen would indicate that my pilot has flown his last mission. Given the time and inclination to read the manual and watch the mission briefings, I can see how this type of game might appeal to players, but it's not for me. It's just not worth investing the effort. Back onto the shelf with this one then. This is Blue Max, released by US Gold in 1984. Before we get into the game though, I noticed this card inside the box. 
Joining the US Gold Club apparently will get you information on programmers and the company, as well as a newsletter, and all for just $9.99. Digging into the archives, there are a few newsletters to read, but they seem to just promote new games from US Gold. But then again, as an adult, I would expect this kind of behaviour. Onto the game itself then, and you play Max Chatsworth, known as the Blue Max. You're on three missions to destroy targets within cities, but of course you have to get there first. This game obviously takes inspiration from Zagzon. Your plane flies diagonally as the landscape scrolls, and enemy targets appear in the form of bridges, planes and cars. To destroy them you just shoot or bomb them. To drop bombs you have to press the fire key and down key at the same time, but you have to be careful with this, especially if you are flying at low altitude. The scrolling is jerky, and most of the graphics are monochrome, and the sound is a bit dull too, with just a few blips here and there. Gameplay is challenging, mainly because of the colours used, which sometimes make it tricky to work out where your plane is. This usually ends up with you crashing or being shot. At the end of the level, you land back on the airstrip and get fuel and repairs. However, you're vulnerable down there and can get killed by enemy planes just flying over. This is a bit unfair, really. You've managed to get through the level in one piece, shot down a load of things and blown up even more things, and then you land and then somebody comes along and bombs you. Brilliant. The control panel changes colour to reflect different hazards. For example, it turns magenta if you are getting too low. This can be distracting a bit though, but I suppose it gives feedback that is easy to spot rather than having to check a small dial somewhere. Once you get used to the placements and the bomb speed, you can take out a few targets quite easily. But again, just as you're enjoying things, a plane crashes into you giving you no chance to get out of the way. This isn't a bad game, and it's certainly worth a quick blast, but it's not one I'd really play again. This is Three Octopuses, released by Kaz29 in 2017. Here we have a very different game that reminds me a little bit of Bubble Ghost on the Amiga. You have to guide three octopuses to safety one at a time. To do this, you have to bounce them through various screens. This may sound easy, but it isn't, and sometimes this can be a bit frustrating. The idea is great, and a nice change from the usual shooters and platform games released nowadays, and the game mechanics certainly challenge your brain. As you can see, you do not directly control the baby octopuses, instead you control a jellyfish. Positioning this underneath the octopuses will bounce them upwards, and using this technique you have to get them to safety. The danger area is the bottom of the screen, if they reach that, they will die, so you're constantly stabbing the keys to keep them bouncing upwards. The game proved tricky for me, even after a few plays, as the jellyfish sometimes get stuck on the scenery, but overall this is an interesting and clever game. There is great tune playing throughout too, which really helps the enjoyment. There are also bonus items to collect along the way, and bubbles that take the octopuses upwards away from your control. So if you enjoyed Bubble Ghost, then you'll love this, certainly give it a try. This is Spooky Man, released by Abex in 1982. No prizes for guessing what type of game this is. Yes, it's a Pac-Man clone, and one from very early on in the Spectrum's life. 
Now the first thing that causes problems is the control. The game seems to randomly pick up keys. So you prod at various keys and your Pac-Man will move up and then suddenly start moving down for no reason at all. If you leave the game alone, the Pac-Man moves on its own as well. I tried changing the issue 2 to issue 3 keyboard settings in the emulator and still nothing. I think the top rows of keys move up, the bottom row of keys move down, the left and right hand side of the middle keyboard move left and right. In 48k mode though it crashed when I picked up a power pill. In 16k mode it crashed when I picked up a power pill. I tried it in a different emulator. It crashed when I picked up a power pill. I tried a third emulator. It crashed when I picked up a power pill. Okay, on to the real spectrum then. And it failed to respond to any key presses. Hmm, interesting. I tried another real spectrum and it failed to respond again. I plugged the joystick in and it responded. And then it crashed when I picked up a power pill. I tried to load the actual tape with no joystick interface in. And that worked fine, although the Pac-Man still changed direction randomly, but at least it didn't crash when you picked up a power pill. Hurrah! This left just one more question. Is the tap file corrupt? I sampled my tape, converted it to a tap file, loaded it into the same emulator, and it worked fine. No crashes. The keyboard was still a bit random, but at least you could play the game. I downloaded the tap file from WAS, and these worked okay, but the game played faster than my original. Here are the two side by side for comparison. The code sizes are also different. Maybe I have an older version, or a newer version. Anyway, I suppose I better get down to the review then. It's an average Pac-Man clone. The graphics move in character squares, but so many Pac-Man clones did in those days. And the sound is a bit poor with just some bleeps here and there. Control is, as already mentioned, abysmal. When you collect a power pill, the ghosts turn into white blobs. And when you run into them to eat them, they turn into red blobs. But they also stop you moving past them, which can be a bit of a pain. If you set the emulator to Kempston joystick, the controls are much better. So that's the best way to play it, if you really want to. But I would stay clear of this one. The control problem alone is so frustrating. But that's another one to put back on the shelf. Let's start with Gauntlet 3. The, the game that I, I wanted us to talk about and you weren't really enthusiastic about it. I wasn't at first. It has grown on me since I started playing it. Hmm. It was your choice. You you kick off and you tell me what you think. Okay. Well, I've, all, well, I've always liked Gauntlet in the arcades and uh, on most of the micros that I've played it on because it lets you get far enough without causing frustration. Hmm. Anybody that's, that's played Gauntlet will know what it's about. And when they released Gauntlet 3, I think they tried to emulate... There's, there's certainly one on the Xbox called um, Gauntlet Legends, I think it is. And, and also, I've, I noticed at Replay, they have the arcade version of that. Gauntlet. Dark Legacy. Now, I don't know which came first, um, but I presume that Gauntlet 3 on the Spectrum is trying to do that sort of 3D look to the game. I got it working on the Div ID eventually. And yeah. when I played it, apart from a few niggles, which we'll talk about, I think it's a really good game. It's sort of the same as the original 2D top-down version, obviously in 3D, although the, the graphics look 3D, but the actual movement isn't. Isn't it? I thought it was. You, you can, okay. if, you, if you hold two keys down, you can scroll diagonally, but it, you can still move left, right, up and down, as though it was a normal game. One, once you got used to the fact that you could walk behind things rather than trying to walk around them, which was quite annoying to start with, because there are trees that you try and walk around, but you can actually walk behind them. Yeah. Um, the game mechanics are the same. There are generators that, that ghosts pop out of and you can destroy the ghosts and get to the generators and destroy them. And the, the graphics are, I think the graphics are brilliant and the sound matches the game quite well. There are a few problems with it. Um, the first one is, is selecting the, the, the game mode because it's very confusing at the start. It says select two player game mode, right, when, when you first load it. And what that means is you're already in one player. So uh, I, 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 that was why I didn't get off to a good start with it. 
Yeah. So when you first said do this, it took me about seven or eight tries just to get yes. a one player game going. <laughs> yes. Because if, if you get two players on, you can't do anything because the second player just stands there doing nothing and you can't you can't move anywhere. But it really got off to a bad start. Funnily enough, my very first impression was I quite liked the music. Then I found the selection absolutely rubbish. I really disliked it. So, right. so that. And then I started playing it and I went, oh. I didn't see what it was trying to do, but I just thought I'd rather play the original. Yeah. I think the original's better. There's mm. more on screen. It doesn't slow down like this does. When you get a few enemies on screen, this really, really slows down. Yeah. And I, I came away. I think what I'd say about it is I think it's a really good tech demo. Right. I think it's showing off some clever 3D kind of scrolling and things like that. It doesn't feel like the gameplay is very deep. I was playing it last night, and you do loop back through the locations, and there are quests to do. So you'll you'll go and you'll find a key, and then it'll tell you that you have to go back and open a, a lock with it. And then you have to you have to go back through the previous screens that you visited before. The original was a bit like that. There were puzzles to figure out in the original, whereas this, it actually, I think, it telling you is detrimental. Yeah, it does does tell you what you have to do and where you have to go. I really hated it when I first played it. Really, really mm. disliked it. I thought, oh god, why, why would anyone play this? And then I've gone back again. I've played it a few times, and I could see if I'd have paid the money for back in the day, I thought, wow, this looks good. I don't think it would be one I would go back to. There are some Spectrum games that I love and keep going back to. This isn't one of them. In fact, right. I'd more likely play the original Gauntlet. The niggles that I have about it are because the graphics are monochrome. Yeah. The treasures and health potions are very difficult to see. And the, yeah. sometimes you only know they're there when you've shot them and it says, don't shoot them, <laughs> which, yeah. which Actually, doesn't I help. I, yeah, I think I, did, I think I did that in that first 10 minutes I did. I think I did that. I thought, oh, God, well, how was I even supposed to know? And, and the other problem, which I really hate, is that stupid vine thing that reaches out of the ground and just stops you dead and reduces your health. And I don't even see the reason for that anyway. That's just so annoying. Um, well, at least it's slightly different to the original. Yeah, the, yeah. There doesn't seem much variation in the enemies either. I, I thought that until until I got really far last night and I got onto a whole new level with um, cavemen, or they look like cavemen, and death. Because I, I was thinking, well, you're collecting death potions, but I haven't actually seen the death figure yet. But he does turn up eventually. I, I was really enjoying it, and then I, I messed up because... Of, um, he eventually came after me, and I, I didn't know what button to press to use the potion. So I pressed all of the buttons, and um, inadvertently uh, started the game for player two, which, which, <laughs> which isn't which, what you want to do. <laughs> which is what I didn't want to do. Yeah. If I was going to mark it out at ten, I'd probably give it six, which is a lot better. I'd have given it one when I first tried to play it. So right, okay. it's grown on me. The more I play it, the more I like it. It's just that I needed, I, I need, really need to read the instructions, <laughs> like like any game that's got multiple keys and things to do. It looks good. Well, yeah. I'll give it that. It looks good. It actually sounds good as well. The sides, good use of sound. So, so I've nearly convinced you then, have I? You've nearly convinced me. I really hated it at first. Especially if you'd have loaded it. Just imagine you bought this on tier and you'd have spent yeah. all the time loading the first thing up. You start the game and it's two player and you're only on one player. <laughs> that that would be, be so annoying. Ah. <sighs> Yes, we're back in Type In Corner again, and as I've run out of games on tape, I thought I'd try and type one in from scratch just to see what would happen. The game I chose was Red Carpet, written by Gavin Devine and published in Popular Computing Weekly in June 1983. From the listing you can see it's some kind of maze game, so after about an hour of typing it all in, I read the instructions and then gave it a try. It seems that you play a carpet layer who has to lay a red carpet for the Queen, however you're in a maze of stars, and colliding with them, or with any carpet trail you've already left, will set off an alarm and kill you. Which is a bit harsh, really. Maybe that's why there's a shortage of carpet layers. Running the game gave me the intro, and a scroll prompt, which is unusual, and as soon as the game began, an alarm was triggered, and the game ended. And then it crashed with an unknown variable. So we have three problems here. Let's get the easy one out of the way first. The variable HS that holds the high score was not recognised. And that's because I typed it in wrong in line 5. OK, that's the first one done. Next, the scroll prompt. I just removed one of the print statements in the maze drawing line. That's another one gone. And now on to the last one. I noticed the position of the player at the start put him right on top of a star, thus killing him instantly. To fix this, I just moved the star position from 12 to 15. 
and also after checking the maze draw lines, I had added an extra blank line, so I removed that, trying to run the game again and it actually works. At the end, the graphics for the word OLD were not right, so I quickly fixed that. Now the game is playable, but, as you can tell, there is only a set amount of points you can actually ever achieve, due to the maze layout. This is how the game was in the magazine though. There's obviously a lot of room for changes here, like different mazes, a set amount of points per level to get to the next maze, someone chasing you, etc etc. But I'll leave that up to you if you want to have a go. This is probably the first time the game has been seen in over 30 years, and it will be available to download on my website after this episode. Thank you.